So I want to thank you, thanks, uh, give thanks to the Virginia Film Festival uh, for today's conversation and to Bonnie and John for joining us. They are the filmmakers for Athlete A and we are so honored to have you with us today um, and to talk about your wonderful film. Um, I'd like you to start just by talking a little bit about how you came to this particular project and any kinds of unique challenges you faced while uh, putting the project together, putting the film together. Sure. Um, I can start. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you from both of us to the Virginia Film Festival. We're really thrilled to be here and um, uh, it's lovely to have an opportunity to talk about the film with you, Bonnie. Um, we were uh, we were approached uh, by Jennifer Say, who was a 1986 U.S. champion in gymnastics, uh, and who wrote the book released in 2008 called Chalked Up, which was about the psychological and physical abuses that she suffered uh, during her tenure as a gymnast, um, and. You know, she approached us sort of in the middle of the Larry Nasser case unfolding. He had already been arrested, but the trial hadn't gotten underway. And there was still a lot, you know, all the reporting had come out, et cetera. And we talked together about uh, how important it would be to look at the Larry Nasser case in the context of the broader abuses that had been going on for decades inside of USA Gymnastics, which is the federation that runs gymnastics um, in the United States for those who are interested. There's the US Olympic Committee, and then there are federations from there that filter down to all the individual sports. USA Gymnastics is the one that presides over gymnastics in this country. Um, and what we discovered through our discussions with Jen is that there were just tremendous amounts of abuses in local gyms around the country, all the way up to the Olympic trained athletes. Um, sexual abuse was part of that, but it was within a larger context of just, you know, psychological and physical abuses. So John and I started to think about how important it would be to start to investigate a film that dealt with that larger context because we are consumers of the Olympics ourselves. We watch gymnastics every four years. We love the sport. I grew up doing medium to okay gymnastics myself. Um, and the fact that the system was so corrupt became, you know, started to needle away at us and we got more and more involved in starting to investigate the possibilities of the film. Great. Um so over 500 women and girls have um, accused Larry Nasser of sexually abusing them. Can you discuss your decision to use Maggie Nichols's story to anchor your film and to pr also to prominently feature Rachel Dunn Hollander, Jimmy Dancher, Jessica Howard, and then you've already talked about um, Jennifer Say. So could you kind of make your, uh, talk a little bit about how you decided to focus on those stories when indeed so many victims um, have now come forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one thing about this film, the hallmark in terms of us, uh, just kind of as documentary makers, was how complica complicated and far reaching the scandal was that we were, that we were trying to you know, show in the film. Um, you know, the, the, actually even the immediate scandal of Nasser is a giant scandal, not to mention the stuff Bonnie was talking about in terms of the overall culture, abusive culture of USA gymnastics. Um, one thing that we kind of hit on early on that helped us organize our thinking about it was, um, there was, a, there was kind of an exciting way in which this story unfolded. Um, uh, almost like if you can imagine a relay race, you know, somebody starts running down the track with a baton and then it gets passed to another person. And pretty soon, you know, you're miles into this race. That's, that's kind of what happened um, really beginning um, with the reporters at the, at the uh, Indianapolis Star started pulling out a thread on a story that was kind of tangentially related to, to the Nasser story. Um, and they had no idea what they were really even getting into. Um, and so what we decided to do is kind of t tell the story as it unfolded, um, first from the reporter's perspective. And, um, you know, as, as the film shows, 
they, they reported on kind of the general lack of policy of dealing with abuse at USA Gymnastics. That led to Rachel Denhollander and Jamie Dancher and Jessica Howard calling them and emailing them and saying, hey, great, great writing. What about this doctor? We had this doctor who abused us, three different women from, who didn't know each other from around the country. And it expanded out from there. When Bonnie and I got involved in making the film in, in 2017, it was roughly the time when uh, the Indianapolis Star reporters were figuring out that um, the, the Nasser uh, um, scandal actually was known at USA Gymnastics well before the public knew about it. And that's where Maggie Nichols came in. She had reported Nasser to internally at USA Gymnastics over a year before the public even knew about uh, his um, crimes. And so that's what we decided. We, it was kind of natural for us to follow that particular thread because Maggie was unique in the sense that she was brave enough to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, um, this doctor is doing these things to me, doesn't seem right. And then it was a long time before USA Gymnastics took action. It was, it was well after they got pressure, basically public pressure to do anything about it. So she became a, a very important figure in our mind because she, she was kind of this um, early whistleblower that, that the public really didn't know about until much later on. So there, there are a couple of things I want to kind of um, talk with you about from, from these comments. The first one is the investigative journalists at the Indy Star. Uh, and their reporting reminded me a whole lot of the Boston Globes in 2002 um, that really kind of thrust the sexual abuse of Catholic uh, clergy into the national spotlight. And I see kind of the Indy Star doing much of the, the same thing with gymnastics and kind of sport more broadly. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the media really drawing attention and kind of getting behind this and really featuring those stories of the survivors and, and believing them, you know, Rachel Denhollander in particularly commenting that, you know, she had gone and reported and she was, it just wasn't time yet that she wasn't, people weren't, that you're the only one reporting this. And then Maggie Nichols starts to report and that actually comes to the fore. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the media here? So we really saw that what, what really attracted us to this story to begin with was the investigative reporting team um, at the Indy Star. Obviously, it's an incredibly powerful story and we wanted to tell it from the perspective of the survivors. But it is important to note that the, that we have tremendous reliance now more than ever in this country on the value of great investigative reporting. And, you know, here's this team. This is, this is not the New York Times or the Washington Post. This is the Indianapolis Star. These are, this is a, you know, a team of just, you know, get a tiger by the tail investigative journalists who don't let go um, in a small town who are fighting they're, you know, a small city in this country, Indianapolis, they're fighting for money to be able to continue with the story. Every time they report one piece of it, they have to fight to get to be able to do the next one. And um, we really wanted to highlight that in the film because without them, these stories fall on deaf ears. And what was very interesting for us was that, um, as John said, we set up this kind of, um, you know, relay race, which is a great way to think about it. But it's like, if, if one of these pieces hadn't come together, then we might not have been able to put Larry Nasser behind bars. And that was a combination of the bravery of Rachel Denhollander, Jessica Howard, and Jamie Dancher, who just to reemphasize were three different women from different parts of the country who had never known each other, who all called into these reporters and, realize, and the reporters realized that they were telling the same story about the same guy and started to you know, interrogate that further. Um, they, the, the journalists and the survivors rely on each other to be able to amplify the truth. And it's only at that moment where the truth can be amplified publicly that we have the opportunity for all of these other women and girls to come out and feel safe and um, confident that the tr their truth is gonna be heard. So um, that, that uh, the importance of investigative journalism in this country, which by the way is being battered every day that, that, um, that we pick up a newspaper, you know, budgets are being cut, it's undervalued. We felt it was really important to trumpet that work as the real kind of um, strength behind how these stories got out into the public. And you know, uh, 
it's so true. And, um, you know, one thing I want to be careful of is we, we don't mean to belittle any survivor of NASA or any other predator out there. There, there are hundreds of yeah. NASA survivors out there, um, all of whom are incredibly brave people, many of whom actually did speak up to their yeah, parents, to their, uh, to their gym uh, coaches, to their university officials, to their school officials. What, what's, um, and of course, um, uh, you know, goes all the way back to the late 90s. Uh, Larissa Boyce, um, uh, you know, complained about this uh, at Michigan State in the, in the 90s. Um, but the interesting thing here is that combined, when somebody comes forward, combined with the power of, of investigative journalism, is, is really where this thing took a turn. And um, we were able to see some justice in this case. And I just wanted to underlie that we in no way wanted to take away from no, the, the incredible work that many of these people did over years, decades. Um, but we wanted to highlight the special relationship between what happens with the press and you know, when, you, when you combine it with a, an, an injustice that they start to pull the thread on. Well, you talk about amplifying voices. You certainly did that with survivor voices that were so critical for the film, the, the interviews that you conducted, um, the footage you included of the impact statements um, at uh, Nasser's hearing. How important was it to you to provide survivors with a voice? We, we wanted to tell the story from the perspective of the survivors. This needed, this film couldn't be told any other way except in the voice of the survivors. Um, and when we first contacted Rachel and Maggie and, and Jamie and Jessica and, and a number of others, that was, our, that was our pitch to them. You know, you are gonna tell your story. You are gonna hear your story back in this film. You're not gonna hear our version of the story. You're gonna hear your version of the story. And um, we were actually very gratified before we put the film out publicly, we gathered them all together and showed the film. Um, and they really felt that they, that their voices were, were the, in the foreground. And that was, that was the most important thing to us. Yeah. You know, one interesting, one le lesson for Bonnie, I mean, we, we had made a film um, that, that, that centered on a, a, a two different sexual assaults um, earlier called Audrey and Daisy. And so we, we kind of knew a little bit about this landscape and, um, one thing, of course, that, that you immediately learn as somebody who's telling these stories is the idea of kind of re-traumatization and, and kind of treading lightly um, with people that have had trauma in their lives. And one interesting lesson for Bonnie and me on, on Athlete A is that it, from our experience, it's not that these survivors don't want to tell their story, but when they do tell their story, they want to feel like they are being listened to and, and believed at some point basic human level, which seems kind of crazy to say, but that that's controversial, but of course it is. And uh, there's a lot of women who come forward, a lot of men who come forward about sexual assault and don't get believed um, right away. And so as soon as we kind of went in with what Bonnie was saying, this kind of basic idea, like, look, we're just here to listen and, you know, kind of assume that you're telling us the truth. Um, People, the survivors generally wanted more detail in there. Mm -hmm. They wanted they wanted the public to know what they went through, gory details and all. And um, so, um, it's not that uh, we wanted to make some kind of purient true crime film, but we wanted it to feel like um, you know, like again, this kind of um, sort of groundswell was happening, starting with those early survivors. And we wanted the the, the we wanted to show what happens when you when you kind of you know lend sort of a trusting ear, really at some basic level, that's what it's about. Were there stories you wish you could have included? Were there interviews you had hoped to conduct and couldn't? Um, I mean, that's, all, uh, that's always the case. Oh, always. In fact, we were um, just yesterday, um, we're doing, we're, we're excited to um, report that we're, we're, we're doing a, a series of outreach events for this film, community engagement events that that touch on, you know, things like, how do you parent an athlete these days, knowing what we know about um, the potential for abuse? How, how do you be a good coach these days? What are the, you know, how, how do you correct some of these wrongs that have gone on? And we were, in, in order to prepare for one of these events, we unearthed a, a, a story that we shot, but never put in the film, which is the story of how this all really got started, a legal case down in um, near Savannah, Georgia, where a mother, 
put her nine-year-old uh, daughter into a gymnastics gym, a local gym, um, because the girl wanted to tumble. And uh, she was, after she started, the mother got a warning um, from another um, parent. On that, her, a, a note put on her windshield. Yeah, that, that, there, outside the gym. that there was something amiss with this, with this uh, coach. She called USA Gymnastics headquarters, asked if there was any truth to this, they said, no, as far as we know, this guy, Bill McCabe, is a coach in good standing. It turns out that USAG had had many complaints about this guy um, in years past, but it didn't meet their bizarre criteria for what would amount to a, a, a real complaint or a real, a real course of action. And so they didn't tell her that they had other complaints about him, and her daughter went on to be abused by this guy. And um, that was the original case that allowed this lawyer down there, this amazing guy, Brian Cornwell, um, to do discovery and do depositions and, and basically discover that USAG had this bizarre policy that they would not investigate coaches unless they were complained to by an eyewitness or the actual victim. The victim, who, by the way, was a child. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, or a victim's parents. Or a victim's parents. And, the, and Jennifer Say talks about, you know, this kind of culture of physical abuse, verbal abuse, not trusting yourself, and then, you know, not, not, when, so that when abuse, sexual abuse happens, oh, okay, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not in a position to report it. Uh, and so I think all of that was just a really powerful point uh, about USAG really operating under rules of their own, or at least, and, and, and the hubris that in which they thought they could operate under rules of right. their own. Um, I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about um, the success of Nadia Comaneci um, in 1976 at the Montreal Games uh, and Mary Lou Retton's success in 1984, really kind of marking important paradigm shifts in the, in the sport of gymnastics. Um, I think what's really interesting is that in 1968, the gold medal winner was Vera Kozlovska, who was 26 years old, five foot three and 121 pounds. Uh, by 1976, so just eight years later, Nadia's 14, she's five feet and she's 85 pounds. And the feeling was that, you know, the, the smaller bodies of girls who could do flips and twists and all the tricks was really um, something that older women, larger women just couldn't do. And then in 1984, Mary Lou Retton's the darling of the LA Games, her gold medal win nets her the cover of a Wheaties box, which is the first mm -hmm. time a female athlete's on the cover of a Wheaties box. She's Sportswoman of the Year for Sports Illustrated. She, en she enjoys all sorts of kinds of endorsements. And so you have this kind of culture of little girls heading into the gym, uh, particularly after Nadia's Perfect Tens in 1976. I was one of those girls who- So was who I. Uh, but I was not medium or, you know, not even okay. I think I lasted just for a little while. So, but, but you know, this, this interest in girls heading to the gym. And then you have Mary Lou Retton, who um, is gold medal means a whole lot of product endorsements, corporate sponsorships. You've got parents who were interested in pushing their girls into the sport. Uh, and you have both of these women coached by Bella Caroli, for whom now this a particular coaching philosophy is now held up as, as a gold standard. Uh, and you have the USAG then building a brand. So I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about these major pa paradigm shifts and how they contributed to a toxic culture at USA Gymnastics, not just in terms of creating an environment where Larry Nasser can um, operate uh, unchecked, uh, but one that allows coaches to verbally and physically, and in some cases, be sexually abusive as well. Well, you've laid it out really beautifully. I'm not sure what we have to add to that, <laughs> but um, though you've you've laid out, uh, it, uh, maybe you knew this history before, but we do lay it out in the film in just that way. And you've spoken of all the the major paradigm shifts. The first of which was that gymnastics until Nadia was a sport for women. It was, it was women and, you know, they weren't 50, but they were in their 20s. They were of sort of medium weight, normal weights. Um, and when Nadia burst onto the scene, 
with Marta and Bella Caroli, um, that it all of a sudden became a little girl's sport with little boys' bodies. And that's relevant because it wasn't just that they needed to be little and be of lower weight, but there was a suppression of, um, should I wait for that to, I think I'm be able to edit this. There's a, there's a thing going off here. I would just continue. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry about our telephone. Um, uh, there was, it's, it's relevant to think about the fact that they didn't just need to be little, but they needed to suppress um, menstruation and growth into womanhood of any kind physically. Uh, and that became a very, very dangerous prospect for girls coming into the sport who were operating at that Olympic level. So um, that's one thing to unpack. That's one paradigm that's uh, incredibly relevant and important to the physical and psychological abuse that becomes the mainstay of USA Gymnastics going into the decades that follow. Um, you also mentioned the um, second very important paradigm shift, which is the commodification of these athletes. Mary Lou Retton on the Wheaties box, we all remember it, those of us who are of that age. Um, it was an incredibly exciting moment, but it was also a moment when, you know, amateur athletes started to be co-opted by corporations and money started to flow and medals meant more money. And it was impossible to start to separate the success of the athleticism from the success of the corporate, you know, uh, monopolies around these athletes. So um, that is an incredibly important paradigm shift because money and metal started to mean more than the safety um, and health of the young women and girls who were participating in the sport. Um, I'll let you take, I'll let you continue from there. Uh, no, no, there's so, there's well, so there, many things to the, unpack. There's it's so many, just, yeah. The, you know, another thing that kind of came to mind that just reminded me as Bonnie was talking is that, um, you know, this film, we were making this film during the last few years and um, it was impossible not to think about um, this kind of new word that we all talk about, which is kind of systematic problems with, with systemic, um, systemic problems, um, excuse me, with um, our institutions and how systems can lead to um, abuse. And, um, you know, the system was built uh, over the course of time, you could you know, start, you could argue, you know, starting in the 70s and, and certainly in the 80s that the system was put together where you had little girls being coached by adults and the adults were um, more interested in keeping their organization going by getting sponsorship dollars than they were by, uh, you know, um, nurturing young athletes into, you know, fully fledged humans or, you know, uh, some kind of more higher level thinking about how you might be a teacher to a young child. Um, and of course, that system, um, instead of putting the human beings first, it put the money first. And it's almost inevitable that, that this stuff would happen, that you know, when you have a, a, a doctor who's abusing uh, girls in, in that scenario, what do you do as an organization when you see that? That's a, that's a PR problem. That's, not a, um, that's a PR problem that could lead to the, to the cutting off of sponsorship dollars by Coca-Cola and McDonald's and, you know, on down the line. They wanted wholesome images, right? Yeah. So, and uh, we, and we touch on this a little bit in the film and that, that was a really useful way to think about it. Of course, we, we didn't invent this um, way of looking at this. This was, you know, with the help of, of people who really looked at this over time, there's a lot of great journalism and writers who had been talking about this before us. But what we, what we tried to do in the film is present that in a way that, that people could understand that, um, there's a certain inevitability that happens when you have a, a system in place that has the wrong priorities. So, you know, we, in COVID times, we, we don't have a live audience for this conversation, uh, but I have, I teach courses on gender and sport, including the Olympic Games at the University of Virginia. And I had a former student email me over the summer that she and her uh, family had been on a quote Olympic movie kick since we watched all the ones for your class and I think they really <laughs> to my understanding of the topics athlete a was no exception and was at times difficult to watch but also really eye-opening into the scandals associated with USA Gymnastics and Larry Nasser definitely worth watching in my opinion unquote so there's you know um <laughs> confidence in the film from one of my former students for sure 
this makes me think about um, not only USAG needing to rethink uh, its approaches to uh, issues of abuse in sport, but do you also see this film as a commentary on the US Olympic Committee's uh, um, approach and their need to see change um, from that organization, uh, given the charges of sexual abuse, not only coming from USAG, but Taekwondo, swimming, judo, and so on. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 what, we probably both want to attack this one. <laughs> it's a, it's a great, we'll get uh, equal time. We'll give you equal time. It, it's a great question, <laughs> and um, the answer is yes. The I mean, what I was just saying applies at a larger level when you zoom out and look at the way uh, the Olympics are structured in this country, and then you zoom out further and you see the International Olympic Committee. Every country has a uh, a system that um, is you know kind of similar. Um, and it's essentially a very hierarchical organization where, um, you know, the U.S. Olympic Committee, for example, is really beholden to the International um, Olympic Committee, which doles out, um, you know, where the Olympics are going to take place. And that's hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for that host country and city. Um, so, um, again, the priorities are on um, kind of marketing and financial matters. Um, for example, there's no, um, in, in the Olympic um, movement, there's no, there's no equivalent to an athlete's bill of rights or, you know, a, a kind of a, 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 you know, language about um, the importance of, you know, uh, you know, transforming young human beings into, you know, into leaders of tomorrow. It doesn't exist. The, 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 the whole system is, is really a kind of a financial system. And, um, there's experts who far beyond us who have studied this um, and, and are really calling for the need to change that. Well, we're, we're excited that athlete A is, to, is playing a small part in the pushback by the athletes who have been involved in this system to say, hey, wait a minute, we want you to listen to us and kind of think about adding um, structure into your framework that would, you know, that would change the, the priority a bit. And, and take into account the needs of the athletes. You know, when the film dropped on Netflix at the end of June of this year, you know, there was no Olympics this year, right? So there was very little to watch in the area of sports. Um, I think, um, you know, we, we had a lot of people tuning into the film around the world. And as a result, there was a lot of, there were, there were a lot of athletes that came forward publicly for the first time, Olympians, in Australia, the UK, Japan, and not just in, not just gymnasts, although there were a fair share of gymnasts, but athletes across the spectrum of sports who said, wait a minute, this happened to me with my coach, this predominantly the physical and psychological abuses that, and the eating disorders and the, the subservience that was necessary in order to become, you know, or at least that's what they were meant to believe to become this elite level um, it was quite amazing. I mean, kind of the power of Netflix is that in a single moment, this film drops around the world and all these athletes are able to see it and come together and feel like they have a, a voice and have an international movement that's building, um, which for, for us as filmmakers, you know, we've been making films for a long time. This, this new way of distributing our film is just, you know, for if you're making a film about a social issue like this or a, a, a human rights abuse, um, it's very gratifying to see that these these movements can build as a result of the film. Uh, so, you know, we're hoping that that continues and those voices continue to be raised. So we're just at about time. And I just wanted to uh, close with one final question. Um, at the beginning of the film, there's an interview excerpt with uh, John Nichols, who is Maggie's father, and you talk about justice happening in slow motion. And he remarks, hopefully justice, hopefully justice. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what that looks like to the Nichols family um, mm -hmm. and to the survivors more broadly and, and maybe to you. What, what, what does justice look like? Um, well, I think my hunch is in that moment for, for the Nichols family, they would really like to see, and, not, and, and for uh, many other survivors and families who were caught up in this Nasser ordeal, I think they'd really like to see USAG in particular, um, you know, not only admit to the wrongdoing, but um, uh, 
uh, you know, in, in civil court really be punished um, financially for the, the, you know, the decades of ignoring this problem. This, the, Maggie should have never met uh, Larry Nasser. He should have been dealt with decades ago when, when complaints first started to arise about him. Certainly, um, he shouldn't have been working the day after Maggie, uh, you know, uh, reported him to USAG and he should have been, um, you know, the police should have been notified. So I think those are the kinds of things that Nichols families are, are interested in. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, I, we hope that the film also um, kind of shows a, a, a different kind of, I don't know if justice is the right word, but certainly redemption um, for the Nichols family through Maggie's, um, new career uh, as a college gymnast. I mean, she became the most decorated um, university gymnast of all time, winning the NCAA two years in a row. She probably would have won it a third year in a row if COVID uh, didn't get in the <laughs> way. Um, she really is a magnificent athlete. By the way, she she competed against Olymp former Olympians in college, so kind of proving that she really did have the medal to be on the, on that team. And so there's a there's a kind of a sweet justice I think for the Nichols family in that in in that Maggie becomes a a majorly successful athlete with a with a coaching system that actually does put the athletes the priority of the athletes first um, and celebrates their their individuality and their you know kind of meets them where they are and so that was an important story for us to tell and show that you know while they might not have um, criminal or uh, civil justice yet, and they're still waiting on that, um, they do have, I think that they should be proud of, of what Maggie was able to accomplish. Well, Bonnie Cohen and John Shank, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd like to just urge all of uh, the uh, attendees who are watching right now to check out athleteafilm.com. Uh, you include just a number of really fabulous resources on that site, which will allow attendees to engage the film effectively with an online discussion guide, screening questions, information about accountability, which you talk about in the film, uh, the law, the investigative journalism, and survivor stories. It's All of this has been so powerful and so very important, and we really thank you for your help in, in telling the story. Thank you, um, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie, so much. It's been really wonderful to be here.